This is really a history of white people. It's not a history of white over black. It's not a history of the racial schemes that are more familiar in the American South. It's really about differing constructions of white racial identity. I start in antiquity because that is before the invention of race. As everybody who uh, lives in Charlottesville knows, one of the great um, constant surprises of Charlottesville is the, the uh, wealth of really interesting people with very interesting connections and interests that we have in this community. And among those is our good friend Ed Barber, uh, who for many years, we won't say how many, but for many years was a senior editor at W.W. Norton and Company. And uh, through Ed Barber's uh, connections with Norton and with other publishing houses, we are able to uh, routinely attract some of the most important recent authors uh, to come to Charlottesville. So I want to recognize uh, Ed and acknowledge his contribution and the contribution of many others uh, in helping us attract uh, people like today's guests. Thank you very much, Ed. We have uh, long understood that race is a cultural and not a genetic construct. In the American South, uh, we have been especially aware of the advantages of being classified as white rather than mulatto or Negro or black or Indian. Uh, racial classification for too many years determined whether you could vote, whom you could marry, whether you could go to a concert or enter into a restaurant to buy a hamburger. And the classifications change from time to time with curious results. In Virginia, for example, state law in 1705 classified as mulatto anyone with at least one-eighth African ancestry. And then in 1785, the percentage of African ancestry necessary to be determined or to be classified as non-white was raised to one-fourth. So someone who in 1784 was classified as mulatto because she had one black great-grandparent might in 1785, after they changed the law, claim status as white. And then in 1910, the General Assembly redefined black persons as having more than 1 16th of Negro blood. So someone who in 1909 had all the rights and privileges of a white person in 1910 could lose those privileges. Then in 1924, Virginia adopted the so-called one drop rule, which said that to be classified as white, one must have, quote, no trace whatsoever of any blood other than Caucasian. Nell Irvin Painter has now come to help untangle all of this for us. Uh, she adds immeasurably to our understanding of the fluidity of racial classification by showing us that this didn't happen just in the American South and not just since the beginning of the importation of African slaves, but that it has been going on for tens of centuries and in many parts of the world. Dr. Painter has the education and experience to tackle this ambitious project, fairly described by the title of her new book, The History of White People. Her undergraduate education was at Berkeley in anthropology with time out at the University of Bordeaux studying French medieval history. She read African studies at the University of Ghana, earned a master's degree in African history at UCLA, and was awarded her PhD in American history from Harvard. She is now the Edwards Professor of American History Emeritus at Princeton Professor Painter is the author of something over 75 articles and eight books. Please welcome Nell Urban Painter. Good morning. It's nice to see you. It's nice to be here in Charlottesville. 
Um, what I'm going to do is start talking to you, and then I'm going to show you some images and talk to you while I show you images. And then I'm also going to ask you some questions. I'll start by asking you questions. Please raise your hand if you feel you have a racial identity. Okay. Please raise your hands if you feel your parents had a racial identity. That's a few more, isn't it? <laughs> Please raise your hand if you feel grandparents had a racial identity. Okay, that's about everybody, isn't it? I think I'll go home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll come back to this, um, but you're already you're already ahead of the game, so maybe we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, first, I want to make some clarifications for my introduction, and that is that this is really a history of white people. It's not a history of white over black. It's not a history of the racial schemes that are more familiar in the American South. It's really about differing constructions of white racial identity. And I start in antiquity because that is before the invention of race. Race was invented as a scientific category during the Enlightenment, during the 18th century. And so when we read race back, we're really reading back categories that did not exist in antiquity. And so I start with the Greeks and the Romans to show you what they considered important, which is not what we consider race. So what is race? It's a scientific system of classifying permanent, innate, biological differences between various groups of people. It arose during the 18th century Enlightenment when science replaced religion as a source of truth. And we're seeing now that religion is returning. Maybe religion never went away, but certainly religion is uh, rivaling science now as a source of truth um, right in our own country. Although race is said to be scientific, there has never been agreement on the number of human races or even the criteria to be used to determine them. So those have changed over time even within uh, one person, one scholar. One of the long last, uh, longest lasting criteria, which is skull measurement, and I'll show you what I'm talking about in a moment, that has lost much of its power. So Americans, um, well, Americans with eyes in their heads, also realize that skin color is no longer an, a reliable guide to racial difference. Uh, I have told you that this is not a black-white history. This is not a history of the terrible things that white people have done to other people. It, changes, it traces changing concepts of the white or European race says, plural, from antiquity before the beginning of the invention of the scientific concept of races, right to the present time. Uh, for most of the last 200 years or so, race was not thought to pertain only to non-white people. Race talk continued right across the color line to um, embrace people who we consider as part of one white race and see them as different white races. Um, so white has the, the, the classification of white has only been part of our obsession with race, and it also has not been all there was to it. So within the history of the United States, there never was a time when Europeans were considered non-white. So it's not a question of people becoming white, because it was very clear, say, for purposes of voting, that poor Irishmen were white people, but that's not all there was to it, so we'll get, to get back to that. But they were considered white people. The races that were considered alien races, 
in the early 20th century, Jews, Slavs, Italians, they were always considered white. They just weren't the right kind of white people. So uh, I'm gonna take you through brachycephalic alpines, dolichocephalic Mediterraneans, with a quick look at the Jewish race. Uh, so this is to tell you that the idea of one big unitary white race, this is an idea from about the 1950s. Today, the notion persists that people of color have race, or you might say erased, but that white people are not. But you all, very sophisticated, you knew that already. Often, if I ask people, audiences like this, who has a racial identity, people who consider themselves non-white will put their hands up. But people who consider themselves white, they're not sure. <laughs> now, this, this being a census year, that helps a little bit, because people <laughs> have to check. Um, but uh, sort of in everyday life, the idea, is, I think, still pertains. We can talk about this in questions and answers, that the people who have race are non-white. And the people who don't have race, the people who are individuals, are people classified as white. Now, um, the concept of white people has a history. That's what this book is about. And I want to select five pivotal moments from the forging of the identity of the American. The American is an idea, it's certainly an idea that existed in the 20th century when I was a student. Um, probably most of you are familiar with that turn of phrase, are you? The American, the idea of the American, the American mind, yes? Okay. So um, until quite recently, the assumption was that the American was a white male a northerner, not a southerner, uh, probably middle class. Um, and so I want to select five moments from that history to talk to you about the history of the concept of white people. And I want to start with Göttingen, Germany uh, in 1795. But that is a man named Jan Friedrich Blumenbach. And Blumenbach was the man who called white people Caucasian. That's how I started writing this book. People say, why, where'd you get that idea? Why, why did you decide to write this book? And I said, you know, I wondered why white people were called Chechens. Because remember in the late uh, 20th century and the early 21st century, there was all this fighting around the Caucasus. And we saw images of burned out buildings. We saw images of Chechens and bearded terrorists and so forth. And I thought, why are white American people called that? And so it took me back to this figure, Jan Friedrich Blumenbach, who was a professor at the University at Göttingen. And in 1795, he decided to call white people, or the European variety, as he would say, um, Caucasian. I'll come back to that. Uh, the second moment is the northern U.S. in the mid-19th century when two white races were thought to live together, well, I wouldn't say live together, but share the territory. Um, and those two white races were the Saxon and the Celtic. And my central figure in that section is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, Emerson was the Saxon. And on the other hand, there were the Celts, who were Patty and Bridget. And this was the moment of massive, impoverished migration from Ireland. The third moment is American scholarship from the first quarter of the 20th century. And at this moment, the idea of three European races, three white races held sway. And that kind of scholarship led to the curtailment 
of immigration from Europe or from Southern and Eastern Europe. And um, poor immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were stigmatized as alien races based on their skull shape and their intelligence. At that point, the Irish were accepted into the American as Northern European Nordics. The Nordic is a term from the early 20th century. But the Jews, Italians, Slavs, and Greeks were still excluded as alien races. And at the same time, eugenics stigmatized poor Southern Anglo-Saxons as degenerate families. And this is the Carrie Buck story, um, which had its denouement right here in Charlottesville. The fourth moment is the American political economy during and after the New Deal and the Second World War. And we can kind of sum that up as the <coughs> development of the suburbs. So after the Second World War, uh, American governmental lending policies fostered a residential apartheid that in the 1950s and 1960s ringed impoverished, deindustrializing cities with new all-white suburbs. The children and grandchildren of the formerly alien races and degenerate families had become simply hardworking white Americans, the American. The fifth moment is the remaking of race in the USA in the early 21st century, our own time, after the end of legalized segregation and in the midst of renewed immigration, heavily from Latin America. Immigration from Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean are breaking down not only official US census class classifications, but also bringing immigrant mobility into black identity. Black may still signify poor, but not to the extent that it did before 2000. And as the figure of black becomes less obviously poor, the figure of white becomes less obviously privileged. So that's a quick scheme. Let's go back and look just a little more closely. First, Göttingen, Germany, 1795, the invention of the term Caucasian based on a beautiful skull. Professor Jan Friedrich Blumenbach envisioned a single but quintessentially beautiful white race stretching westwards from Russia, southeastwards into India, and then uh, westwards into North Africa. So this was a large category that was not very useful in Europe, actually. Um, so it's much more likely to be found in the United States and to a certain extent in Great Britain. So there's poor Jan Friedrich Blumenbach. Blumenbach based his uh, designation on the most beautiful skull in his collection. Now, the this is a beautiful skull, you have to admit. Uh, and part of the reason for its beauty is that it is the skull of a very young person. It is a female skull, and I know from the cover letter that accompanied it from Moscow to Göttingen that it was the skull of a young woman from Georgia, that is Georgia between the Black Sea and the Caspian, who had died suddenly of venereal disease. That is to say, this young woman was a sex slave, and she came from the area of the world which has produced slaves from time immemorial. Herodotus did not know when that trade started. So this skull reminds us of sex, it reminds us of femininity, it reminds us of beauty, and it reminds us of the age-old white slave trade. So it also reminds us of Blumenbach's methodology, which was the measurement of skulls. So he was not looking at a cute chick, he was looking at a skull. He had a skull collection, he was a scientist. So the skull has remained a focal point, or did remain a focal point for 100 years. The skull, the head, the brain, IQ measurements for nearly 200 years. Uh, 
Though Blumenbach called for only one white race, a very big one, this classification didn't prevail until the middle of the 20th century. So let's go to the uh, northern US in the mid 19th century. And here we come to the erection of the Saxon or the Anglo-Saxon as the American. And the Saxon is opposed to the Irish Celt. Uh, often people have a hard time believing, about, uh, conceiving of the amount of hatred uh, directed at Irish Catholics because it seems that um, real deep, hard-running, murderous hatred can only be directed at non-white people. This is not true, as the Holocaust unfortunately showed us. So um, the poor Irish of the mid-19th century were stigmatized in many ways, and one was in terms of their appearance. I mentioned the beauty of Blumenbach's skull and the idea that to be part of a superior race was to be beautiful. This is hung on, and in fact it still hangs on, that uh, to be desirable uh, makes you better, and to be a desirable race makes you a better race. So here we have the Saxon of Florence Nightingale opposed to the Celt. Uh, as we see, um, the Irish were considered Celts. They were considered ugly, primitive, dark-skinned, dark-haired, a race whom the Saxons had conquered. And so this iconography comes from Great Britain, but it circulated in the middle of the 19th century in the United States. So we have contrasting faces to show that the inner person is expressed with the outer appearance. We have Thomas Nast. This comes from Reconstruction, the ignorant vote. You see that the, black, the figure labeled black is clearly a, a hayseed, he's a peasant, he's barefoot, he has his broken little hat. The figure labeled white is a Celt. This is um, stereotypical Irish um, uh, stereotype from the hat to the uh, ape-like um, uh, face. You see this over and over and over again as the characterization of the Irish and then another Nast cartoon, um, this sums up the use that Irishmen, even as stigmatized as an, as an inferior race, were able to exercise in the American um, polity as white men, as voters. And here you have the Irishman, um, his shillelagh says, a vote. And he's together with the former Confederate and the New York Democrat. And they are trampling on the black Union veteran. And the ballot box and his veteran's hat are rolling beyond his reach. This is called, um, this is a white man's government. The figure best known for providing the educated view of the Saxon, or the American as Saxon, is Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, plays a central role in my book as a, a beautiful orchestrator of ideas that were circulating about white races in the United States. Um, Emerson felt that the American was a Saxon because the Englishman was a Saxon, and Americans were double distilled Englishmen. So he had a view, and when he said Saxon, he didn't mean Saxony around Dresden or Leipzig. His Saxony and the Saxony of Anglo Saxonists is a Saxony that's kind of squished in there between the Netherlands and Denmark. Have any of you been there? <laughs> yes, yeah, you've been to Saxony, yeah. yeah. Uh, he wrote a book uh, published in 1856 called English Traits, which is his race book. And if you want to know 
uh, Emerson's thinking about uh, white race. It's in English traits. But he gave lectures from the 1830s, 40s, and 50s on these topics, permanent traits of English na national genius, for instance. Uh, in the 1850s, the Anglo-American. So for Emerson, the American was essentially an Englishman who was essentially a Saxon. The next moment is uh, US um, scholarship in the first quarter of the 19th century. And this is the most influential book on um, the white races, published in 1899 by a professor at Columbia, then at Harvard. This book actually got him his Harvard professorship. Uh, his name was William Z. Ripley. And uh, this is called The Races, note plural, of Europe. Um, this scholarship is voluminous. This is simply the most quoted and the most reproduced book. And this was the book that laid the groundwork for the cutting off of immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, Ripley used up-to-date methodology, including hundreds of images, to show racial types. And this also was standard in the anthropological uh, literature of the time. And he explained how he designated his European races. And that was the cephalic index. This was what he called the best test of race. So um, the three races, oh, there's Ripley. Uh, that is his Harvard professor image. And it says on the bottom, uh, which you can't see here, it says, please return to Professor Ripley. <laughs> <laughs> I found it in the Harvard archives. <laughs> So here are his three white races. Um, the first is Teutonic, which is dolichocephalic, that is a long head and light colored. The second is Alpine, which is brachycephalic, which is round headed and kind of brownish. And the third is Mediterranean, which is again long headed, but dark. And he included images to show you the long head and the round head. Interestingly enough, both of these skulls come from the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> and in case you don't wander around seeing skulls, here are actual people to show you how these three different races appear in life. And it's always with the Teutonic in the top and the Alpine in the middle and the Mediterranean at the bottom. Now, um, there was one big problem with this scheme is it didn't include Jews. Jews have been a problem for right, white race taxonomy uh, from the beginning of this taxonomical history. For Blumenbach, um, he wasn't sure. It's the Jews in the laps. They come in, they go out. Are they a race or not? Are they European? It's never quite clear. So for Ripley, he said he was very progressive in his time. He said, Jews are not a race. And this was at a moment when it was very common to speak of the Jewish race and to stigmatize Jews according to race. He said, no, no, Jews are not a race. They are a people. And they look like the people around them. He said, plus, it's not that different. Those of you who go around saying that there's a pronounced Jewish nose, it's not that different. He said, you take the nostrality of the Jewish nose there on figure one, and you kind of pull it down a little bit, and then you kind of straighten it out. See, this is how to make a Jew into a Roman. <laughs> Now, by this point, the um, Saxon-Celt distinction had faded because two things were going on. The first is that uh, a couple of generations had passed since the famine Irish, and with the vote, 
um, the Irish were able to take advantage of politics and patronage jobs and so forth, and to take advantage of um, universal education in the North. So the famine Irish of the 1840s and 50s had become the union um, foreman, had become the teacher and so forth of the turn of the century. So the, the um, mobility built into access worked very well. And the other was that there was a new wave of immigrants, a big new wave of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. And the Irish got put into a new category, a 20th century category. It was no longer Teutonic. The new category was Nordic. And Irish were within Nordic. The people stigmatized by race were now people from Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, they were stigmatized largely as being, um, being stupid, actually, because this is the era of IQ testing. And there was widespread IQ testing during the First World War. So um, the First World War in the United States unleashed a, a real tide of hysteria. And when I say racial hysteria, I don't mean the Red Summer against black Americans only. In addition, it unleashed uh, racial hysteria against European immigrants. And this is the moment when uh, a, just a wave, and maybe that's the right word, wave, of uh, anti-Semitism overtakes Americans. So this, uh, this cartoon comes from the Saturday Evening Post. The Post was the most widely circulated magazine in the United States at the time, with some two million subscribers. It was uh, very influential, and it was rabid against the immigrants. That they were called sometimes the new immigrants. And so this cartoon uh, is called Look Out for the Undertow. You have a, a family, uh, an American family, striding into the waves, heedless. The father is heedless. He is the employer of cheap immigrant labor. So he does not see the threat of immigration, which is what this uh, wave says. The mother, who also gaily goes into the waves behind him, is a sentimentalist. A sentimentalist was usually a woman but was someone who did not hate the guts of the immigrants. Someone who, say, worked in a settlement house, was a social worker, knew something about the immigrants, and was not opposed to them. And so these people were dismissed by people like Theodore Roosevelt as sentimentalist. So she has no sense of the danger lurking. The only one who is pulling back is the child the future of America. And behind the wave, you see the mortal threat. And it says, uh, the wave says immigration, and behind the wave are lowered standards, race degeneration, Bolshevism, and disease. And these are the threats that the alien races and this is the alien races from Europe. They're not talking about black people or Indians or Asians. They're talking about Europeans. Uh, ambitious psychologists took advantage of the war by administering IQ tests to millions of draftees and producing scientific, quantified evidence that the immigrants were stupid. So, uh, the immigrants belong to inferior races, that is, the Alpine and the Mediterranean. And this uh, is a page from, uh, well, it's part of a page, from um, a book by a Princeton professor published by Princeton University Press. And um, the book is called A Study of American Intelligence from 1923. And it lists the proportion of Nordic, Alpine, and Mediterranean blood in each of the European countries. So 
with this, with this table, you can tell how many of which race are in various countries. Um, go down to Turkey, for instance. So you have Turkey unclassified, which has one set of numbers. Then you have Turkey in Europe, including Serbia, Montenegro, and Bulgaria. And then you have Turkey in Asia. I leave it to you to figure out which Turk you are dealing with. So this kind of scholarship uh, persuaded Congress to pass the most far-reaching legislation um, uh, uh, until that time by closing, closing down immigration. Now, the fourth moment is the national mobilization to confront the crises of the Great Depression and the Second World War. And these crises, this mobilization, made into voters the children or the naturalized um, members uh, who, of the so-called alien races and their children, maybe even their grandchildren. And by becoming voters, they became part of the American. And so you have uh, a kind of mobilization, but also uh, a move in, into the figure of the American, prompted partly by the bad example of Nazi Germany, but mostly also by the inclusive policies of the New Deal and the Second World War. So by the mid 20th century, a new racial scheme had appeared. And there were said to be three real races, Negroid, Mongoloid, and Caucasoid, in reverse order, of course. Caucasoid first, a Mongoloid, then Negroid. So th these, were, these were the three real races. And there were no sub-races or different races um, within um, Caucasoid. So the, the people within the Caucasoid group had access to two powerful sources of um, wealth, actually. And that was the Veterans Mortgage Guarantee Program and the Federal Housing Authority. These two programs made virtually all their loans to white people. Uh, anybody of my age knows that, well, anybody African American of my age knows that it was not possible to get an FHA loan if you were black um, in the 50s and 60s. So the great example of suburbanization, suburbanization for white people only, and now this category no longer includes Celts or Saxons or Alpines or Mediterraneans or Teutonics or Nordics, it's just white people. And so in places like Levittown, which uh, remained virtually lily white to this day, there were Irish Americans and Italian Americans and Jewish Americans all together. Um, and so uh, in this moment, the classic of the early 20th century no longer held sway. And uh, this is the title page of my copy, which I bought online, deaccessioned from the Lowell, Massachusetts uh, Public Library. So that brings us to the present time. Um, the early 20th century has witnessed another remaking of race in America, this time toward a multiracial, multicultural America that for the first time includes people of African descent in the image of the American. Actually, we don't so much have an image of the American anymore. We're more likely to have an array of Americans of different sorts. This is a very different iconography of our citizenry than prevailed in most of the 20th century and certainly the 19th century. And two great forces have helped uh, work this change. The first is the end of legal segregation, or rather legal exclusion, um, against African Americans, um, a lowering of uh, discrimination. And so those motors of mobility that were um, that Irish Americans and Jewish Americans and Italian Americans could use uh, 
finally became accessible to African Americans in the late 20th century. And on the other hand, large immigration, at the same time as the civil rights movement that struck down the legal barriers for African Americans, the federal government remade immigration law, uh, 1965. And so since 1965, we've had a pouring of immigrants, mostly who do not consider themselves white, uh, people from Latin America, uh, people from Africa, people from the Caribbean, and so forth. Um, and so together, these two large forces are breaking down um, US census classifications, largely based on the old black-white. So um, we have much more going on now. And the two censuses, the census of 2000 and the census of 2010, um, very quickly sum up um, the choices that Americans have now in terms of racial designation. First of all, you decide who or what you are. And uh, it's up to you. And the second is that you have an array of choices, and you don't have to choose just one, and you also have room for other. In addition, today's immigrants are less likely to identify themselves as race, as color. So um, even though something like 78% of native-born Americans can see themselves as white, um, only 46% of foreign-born Americans identify themselves as white, and 23% identify themselves as Asian. The fastest growing proportion of the US immigration population is Hispanic. Uh, and as you know, Latinos can be asterisks of any race. So very often, people of Latino background will classify themselves as other or as Latino, as from their countries, or from a collection of different ways of seeing themselves. So the increase also of interracial marriages and couplings has <clears throat> produced millions who see themselves as neither black nor white. So one in 50 Americans, and this is from 2000, we don't know what 2010 will bring. One in 50 Americans in 2000 uh, identifies himself or herself as multiracial. Um, these people are also overwhelmingly young. So in summary, race, immigration, and labor have long been linked in the Americas where conquest and slavery shaped the conceptual basis of nationality. Over and over again, racial designation has served to stigmatize the poor the poorly paid, the unpaid, the working poor. There's no question but that the idea of race, an idea of permanent difference, serves to keep us apart. But if we look at concepts of race, we see that they change over time, even though the core of the idea is permanence. Um, we need to remember also that these ideas re reach beyond black people or Asians or Native Americans into people now considered white. In short, white people have a history. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I may um, start, uh, you have talked a lot about how classifications were developed, but haven't really touched upon how classifications, the boundaries between classifications have been policed. Could you give us sort of a quick overview of how uh, we have policed these boundaries? And I'd particularly like to know that in, whether in light of the changes in the way we, we take the census by giving people a choice, does that mean that there's going to be less policing, less enforcement of the boundaries than there has been in the past? Uh, most of the policing has been, um, most of the policing of white people, I should say, has been outside the law. 
the policing against people considered black has been legal uh, until the civil rights era of the 1960s. But um, people responded in various ways by, for instance, um, developing something called Scots-Irish in the mid-19th century. Before the um, immigration of the famine Irish, everybody who came from anywhere in Ireland was considered Irish. But with the famine Irish, the older Irish immigrants wanted to separate themselves out, and so they began to call themselves Scots-Irish. And one way you could tell was between whether you spelled your Kelly with two E's or not. And you could, of course, change your name. Um, so most of this policing of white people was on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, and for science, however, which laid the groundwork for how people thought about these groups, um, something called a racial temperament. Uh, this is an old idea that was very popular in the early 20th century. And it was thought that certain races, for instance, the Italian, were singing and dancing races. And so they were not up to doing hard jobs, for instance. One thing I remember uh, from my years as a professor is how much policing of boundaries young people do with each other. And they want very much for lines to be clear. And so say the, the girl who's a skateboarder, um, the black kid who likes grunge music, you know, people who fall outside the, the so-called so right categories, uh, can face some pretty heavy hazing from their fellow students. So this is part of our society, not now so much part of our legal system. Yes, uh, you mentioned, and I was fascinated to learn that the Romans and Greeks apparently had no useful uh, category uh, for race, right. uh, races, and it had no useful function apparently in their societies. And I just wondered, uh, with the advent of the scientific study of races, mm -hmm. what was, uh, did you get a sense for what the function of that categorization was? Uh, what social function did that serve and why did that emerge at that time? Uh, did it serve, mm -hmm. in fact, a social uh, function? Uh, you mean was in polite living rooms or something like that? Uh, not so much, but in terms of the scholarship, it served to um, make sense of the world around us because the Enlightenment is, is the moment as, as Europeans grapple with a much larger world than they thought they lived in. And so the categories are designated to put Europeans at the top or their kind of European at the top. So uh, it's not enough to be a European, you have to be a long-headed, uh, light-eyed European. And every system, and there were, there were hundreds of systems. Um, this literature is not as big as the literature on black people as race, but it's really big. And everybody had their own system, and everybody had their own criteria of deciding. The head shape was just one of the most popular. So it's really a way of saying, Whoever is on top now deserves to be there forever. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your scholarship. Uh, I noticed in the uh, cartoon, the uh, post cartoon, yes. uh, showing the wave uh, coming out of Europe, that uh, cartoon could very easily be in an, uh, a magazine today, except now it would be Mexico yes. instead of Europe. Yes. And uh, yes. things haven't changed at all. Things have changed, I think, um, in an important way, um, ideologically. And that is the discussion is no longer around race. If we had been before, say, 1980, um, we might well be hearing about racial characteristics of Mexicans. So that's a big difference. Your fascinating history suggests that this whole term of race uh, is a human construct and it's been uh, changed over, uh, over the many decades and that it's a very mushy term which would uh, be very well served to be pushed aside if we could. 
Has there been much effort in recent times to dismiss this term, get rid of it, and yes. address us in a different way? Yeah, in the 1990s, um, the psychologists and anthropologists suge suggested getting rid of the term race and using ethnicity. I'm not sure how much help that would be. Um, but the issue is that we, people have need systems of dealing with, with human difference. And so whatever you decide the salient difference is, you have a word for it. Um, one thing that would be useful perhaps in getting rid of race would be getting rid of the idea of permanence, which is central in race. But seeing what people can do with religion, I'm not so sure I want to bring that one back. Um, so I, I don't have an answer. I just want people to know that there's a history here, change over time. Thank you. Um, I actually have a two-part question. Yeah. One is, uh, with all of the problems, with all of the slipperiness and classifications of race, uh, does race serve a useful function? Can it serve, and has it served, and to what extent has it served a constructive or useful purpose? Mm -hmm. And the second has to do with classifications within classifications. Yeah. That is, uh, there are ways in which the slippery classifications of race become gendered, for example. Ooh, yes. You're talking about whites, but I think, for example, of Park's famous assertion that the Negro is the lady, lady of the races. races. And so yeah. the ways in which these classifications about race also bleed into classifications of gender yeah. and, and perform other hierarchical work. Yeah. <laughs> No, but wait a minute. What's your first question? <laughs> Do with all of its problems and its oh, ina yeah, inaccuracy, yes. yeah. has race or can race ever yeah. serve a constructive purpose? Um, well, let's see. For somebody like Emerson, I think it made him feel better t to see himself as a Saxon. Um, uh, and in the Black Power moment, uh, black people could embrace blackness in a way that I think is very constructive. And as I visit my European colleagues who work in women's studies, for instance, or work in immigration studies in Britain, that not having the civil rights moment and not having black power to remake, to take a stigmatized um, identity and say, we're black and we're proud. Not having had that forerunner has really held back, say, women's studies or immigration studies in Europe. They're still saying, oh, we don't want to be ghettoized. Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of thing, like people would say in the 1970s. So the moment of taking what the society considered a spoiled identity and wrapping yourself in it and saying, I'm proud of this, this, I think, is psychologically very helpful. Uh, helpful for people who are black and proud, and helpful for others who say, I want to be gay and proud, say. So the civil rights moment and the black power moment were very helpful for American society in general. The second thing, um, <laughs> now I've forgotten the second question. <laughs> Gender is very important. And it's all wrapped up in beauty also. So that skull I showed you is a female skull. And this was the moment of uh, beauty and sublime, when beauty is female and small and uh, powerless and sublime is big. Um, and so um, racial beauty, Caucasian beauty, for Blumenbach was female. For Emerson, the problem was to masculinize it. And so he turns to violence. And by the time we get to, um, say 1900, then we have a fully masculinized um, Teutonic, which doesn't work out in the First World War. Thank you so much. Um, the chart that appeared before the caricature showed, yes, showed the English at 80% Nordic and 20% Mediterranean, yes. and the uh, Irish 30% and 70% and the Scott 85 and 15. Yeah. What kind of bothers me being <laughs> a Mediterranean myself <laughs> is how does the Irish great 
uh, sorry, 70% as Mediterranean. How did that whole concept come about? Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> this is, this is um, part of the idea that the Irish are the Celtic race. Um, and so if they're the Celtic race, they're the primitive race. And the primitive race has to be short and dark, and dark is Mediterranean. So the English are the Saxons, um, and the Irish and the Welts and the Scots are the Celts. So somebody like Thomas Carlyle, for instance, who was actually born kind of right on the border between, he was born in Scotland, uh, not that far from Lockerbie, but uh, he insisted that he was a Saxon because he was a lowland Scot, not a highland Scot. So these are, I mean, now you see what I'm talking about, okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, this conversation right now has me thinking, are there different ways of seeing? Um, not just different ways of classification, but does seeing change over time as well? Yeah. There are definitely different ways of seeing. And um, we, well, one way I'd like to say of seeing is that before about 1970 or so, black people were pretty much invisible in um, American popular culture. So if you looked at a magazine, if you looked at television, Every black person of my age can say when you had to drop everything and run to the TV because a black person was on. You know, that just didn't happen. So the face of the United States has changed, and we can see non-white people in a way we could not before. Um, the MFA show, uh, my art school, uh, is running right now. And one of the works is by a photographer who took pictures of Holly Berry, um, Oprah Winfrey, and Will Smith, and darkened them. And people can't recognize them anymore. So you know, we, we do, it, uh, appearance carries a message. And you can only see what you're primed, you can only see what you already know. So yes, we, we look differently. This is perhaps a follow-up, um, and obviously the, the, the election of uh, President Obama renewed this discussion about where we are in this country in terms of race. I was just curious about your reactions of now a year after, mm -hmm. uh, a year and some after, where we are yeah. on this. Um, I think um, that the uh, 2008 election is more a consequence of changes that have been taking place since the mid-90s or so. Um, and I experience these, um, as I've been working on this book, I've been working on this book forever, um, <laughs> since the 20th century. <laughs> and at first people, and I taught a class, I taught three classes actually at Princeton on this material. And at first uh, people were interested in my race. You're writing a history, the working title was Whiteness in Historical Perspective. And so they would say, are you writing it as a black person? What are my options? <laughs> um, and it was as if race would sort of dictate what came out of my word processor. But over the passage of these many years, that question has subsided. And um, I th as I experience it, um, people are more willing to, first of all, um, accept that there might be a history of white people, and second of all, accept that a, a person in a black body could also be a scholar, um, which is a great step forward, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think that the, that the changes already had occurred, but as always happens, more changes occur as we go along. Um, and there's, I don't think there's any end to the changes. The things will simply keep changing. I don't know what's in future. I don't know if we'll start classifying ourselves by <coughs> Baptist and Presbyterians and Unitarians or whatever, or if it'll turn out that the, the great uh, divide is between straight and gay or between um, 
people who are handicapped or not, or people who don't have the right DNA. You know, there are infinite ways of classifying people. I'm sure that there always will be ways of classifying. Dr. Painter will uh, be signing copies of her new book, which we will very conveniently offer you for sale in our lobby as you uh, leave the building. Please join me in thanking Nell Painter. Thank you very much.